Hey, it's Eliza. I'm here with Tyler Faith, our curator of archaeology. We've got some really cool specimens out in front of us today. Let's take a behind the scenes look at some of this megafauna. Now, Tyler, this year's theme is plagues and pestilence. What do megafauna have to do with that theme? That's a good question, uh, and it's not even that much of a stretch. The, uh, what, you've, what we've got out here uh, includes some of the iconic bigger mammals that you would have found here in Utah 15,000 years ago. Um, this is the thigh bone of a giant short-faced bear. We have a big old mammoth tooth right here, and a Pleistocene Ice Age bison. And if we, if we travel back in time 15,000 years ago, uh, we would be you know, near the shoreline of Lake Bonneville, where the you know, Great Salt Lake is a, a remnant of that. I'd be right up here at the museum. And Utah and the rest of the, of the continent would be teeming with big animals that we don't see anymore. You could go on safari in Utah in the Pleistocene. And uh, this, you know, what happened? What, they're not here anymore. We all know that. We do not see wild uh, camels and horses and giant ground sloths and mammoths and mastodons walking around in our backyard. What happened? And one of the many ideas that's really captured the attention of scientists across lots of different uh, different disciplines, archaeology, paleontology, paleoecology. Uh, what happened here? How do we explain this? And a cool idea, and we'll evaluate its merits, is hyper disease. And some folks have proposed that as human populations disperse out of Africa, across the globe, uh, they brought with them well, uh, in addition to uh, bringing people, they, they, they brought disease. Uh, and someone suggested that maybe it was this catastrophic disease that was able to jump across different species, and everywhere people went, they, it wiped them out. Yeah, humans tend to have that effect on the ecology. Is, is that understandable? <laughs> yes, we, we occasionally have uh, disrupted how systems work in the past. And, and the extinctions uh, debate, I'd say many people think that people have played a role. Now, disease is, is uh, hyper disease is not necessarily the most popular idea, but it's out there and, and relevant to our theme here, plagues and pestilence. So now this hyper disease that you talk about, uh, do we know anything about it specifically? Was it worms? Was it a cough? What, what kind of things do we know about the disease itself? Uh, well, I mean, as far as we know, the disease does not actually exist. It is more hypothetical <laughs> than anything else. Uh, but a good analog would be something like West Nile virus, uh, which we know is capable of, uh, you know, people can carry it, birds can carry it, mammals can carry it. It, it, it can spread across different, um, different species and different populations. And a key requirement for this disease would, would be, it has to be something where humans are a reservoir for it. Uh, they're carrying some virus or some other thing, and but it doesn't, you know, it's not wiping them out, but they're capable of spreading it and it's bad news for other species that maybe don't have immunity to it. And we have to keep in mind that, you know, in other parts of the world, say, say Africa, there's a long history of, of you know, our entire evolutionary history is there. Whereas when, when human populations showed up in North America in the last, depends who you ask, maybe 22,000 years or the latest dates, uh, you know, they were an invasive species to the continent and any animals there would not have been, uh, have an experience with any sort of disease, diseases, if any, that may um, have been transmitted and, and that would have potentially rendered them uh, helpless to a, a uh, devastating hyper disease. Sure. Now these animals, are they from Utah? Were they found in Utah? Yes, these are all Utah specimens. Uh, this is from not far from Bryce Canyon. And these both here, our giant short-faced bear and our mammoth, are from the Bonneville shoreline gravels. So again, we've mentioned Lake Bonneville it, it reached its high stand 18,000 years ago, so we'd be standing right at the shores of the lake. And uh, it, it was a source of fresh water, it attracted animals, they lived there, they died there, and right along the slopes of the mountain, and you can see the Bonneville shoreline terraces where the waves have cut into the mountains when you're driving through the valley, and uh, they are rich in, in fossil remains uh, in certain places, and so these are all Utah specimens. So these are all Utah specific, but the hyper disease itself wasn't necessarily just in Utah? Did it span over North America? The, the folks who proposed that hyper disease is important have uh, suggested that this is relevant to extinctions in North America, South America, Australia, really global uh, in scope. And uh, this is part of the extinction story. So uh, the you know what happened here in Utah or more broadly in North America is fascinating. 
but it really only makes sense when you start looking at it in the global context. And in, in a nutshell, if we look beginning maybe around 100,000 years ago, human populations start dispersing out of Africa and across the globe reaching the Americas, say, 20,000 years ago. And there's a conspicuous pattern that wherever they went, extinctions soon followed. And that's one of the reasons that many scientists think that humans probably played a role. There's lots of debate there. Uh, so the argument goes that humans could have brought whatever this disease is. And, and again, West Nile virus is the closest analog we have, but it's not caused, it hasn't caused extinctions. Um, but, uh, you know, humans are bringing potentially disease with them wherever they go and uh, wiping out the megafauna. Now what's the likelihood that something of this caliber might wipe out some of the fauna we have today? Elephants, camels? Um, again, this is the, the, the weakness of the hyperdisease hypothesis is that we, there just aren't any good examples. Uh, again, we have certain requirements. It would have to be able to be, have a human reservoir or humans would be the host, yet being relatively immune to it. It has to jump lots of species. It would also have to uh, and a defining feature of the extinctions in the last 100,000 years is that they wiped out the biggest of the big. It was uh, the largest animals tended to get hit the hardest. And so we'd somehow need a disease that preferentially uh, didn't worry too much about the small critters <laughs> and really only affected the biggest of the big. And, and it's unusual. Um, it'd be hard to come up with a disease that does that. It's not saying it do didn't happen. But uh, we don't have any good analogs. And I'm glad we don't, because we did <laughs> yeah. have good analogs for disease that could just run rampant through all different types of vertebrate species. Uh, the world might end up being a very empty place. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to be a part of that if, if this ever hypothetically comes back, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> these fossils are really spectacular. How does your work relate to these fossils? So I've got uh, some active field work and research projects both here in Utah and uh, more broadly globally that uh, address the question of Pleistocene extinctions and what happened. Uh, the last few years here in Utah, I've been uh, going around to caves, high altitude caves in the Wasatch and Uinta Range. Uh, these are vertical caves and pits that um, people wouldn't have been living in them, but animals and other things occasionally fall in and have been for thousands and thousands of years. And so we've explored uh, probably more than a dozen in the last few years. Seeing what's there really is an exploration project because you, you don't know what's there until you get down to the bottom. But each one of these, we, we find animal remains that have been accumulating for, for vast amounts of time. So we're really hoping to find caves that have a really ancient history. And uh, you know, it would make my day to get to the bottom of one of these and find you know, giant short-faced bear femur just sitting there for me. Uh, or a, a fossil camel, you name it. And uh, so we, we've, been, we've been searching for this kind of stuff here in Utah. I also have uh, a very strong interest in, in what's going on in Africa. I do a lot of field work in South Africa and Kenya. And the question of extinctions there in relation to our own species, Homo sapiens, has received a lot less attention. Um, it had long been thought that African extinctions were a lot less severe than elsewhere, and uh, this may reflect a long-term co-evolutionary history between us and other large animals in Africa. Uh, but the reality is a lot of people, for various reasons, hadn't really been working, uh, doing paleontological research in that time period. They were focused on much older stuff uh, associated with the emergence of, say, our genus, uh, the genus Homo or Australopithecus. And uh, so I spent a lot of time, for example, working uh, out in western Kenya, doing field work, uh, doing paleontological collections and documenting, you know, who's, who used to be around the landscape. And there's some, you know, turns out that extinctions there, even fairly recently, were, were quite substantial, a lot more than we appreciate. Oh, wow. And your research is helping us kind of define that extinction process? Yeah, well, uh, so it, it includes documenting species, describing new species, which animals actually became extinct, when this is happening, uh, learning more about the, their ecology, what kind of, kind of environments did they live in, what kind of foods did they, did they eat, and how their extinction relates to long-term climatic, environmental changes, human impacts, and the like. So there's a lot more to learn. We're really, uh, it's, it's been more than 10 years out there, but we're still just beginning to put the pieces together. Well, we definitely appreciate all of your research that you put into this field. And I know a lot of people are really excited to hear from you today. Uh, do you have anything else you want to add before we wrap up here? No, thanks for coming or thanks for tuning in. Um, I, I appreciate uh, having this opportunity to talk with you. And thanks, Eliza, for, uh, for your questions. And I uh, hope to see you here at the Natural History Museum of Utah sometime soon.